I'm here today with Scott Condy, who's a professor of economics at Brigham Young University. Um, and he's also one of our initial INET grant recipients um, for his very interesting project on nighting uncertainty, informational inefficiency, and uh, financial markets. Um, and this is a particularly interesting project because, of course, there's this controversy about whether nighting uncertainty actually is something you can even model. Well, Scott is giving it a try. Scott, welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, what's your, this is, this is an ambitious modeling project. Some people would say you're trying to model the unmodelable. Um, so how are, you, how are you going about doing that? Um, as people have come up with different contexts in which to think about nighting uncertainty, one of the ones that's been particularly important is, is asset markets and the uncertainty that comes in asset markets. And so as we think about being able to model a lack of knowledge of something, uh, one, of the future, of, of the future, and 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 the the outcomes that that are potentially uh, that would be possible in a financial market, then um, one of the things that people have struck upon is this idea that perhaps what we could do is think about investors instead of assigning probabilities to different events in the world, they just say all I know is that there's a set of possible probabilities. You know, if you thought about a coin flip, that that instead of knowing that it's a 50-50 chance that you have a heads or tails, they've said well. What if all I knew was that it was at least a 25% chance of heads? And, and what goes along with that is then, well, what do you do with that knowledge, that, that lesser or, or, or um, more, more vague knowledge, that ambiguity? And, and uh, some people have suggested maybe what people do is just look at the worst case scenario. Uh, that was put forth in, in several papers um, as, as a possible way to model this in the, in the late 80s, Gilbo and Schmeidler being two of the big uh, researchers in this, in, in this area. And, and uh, so what we've done is take their ideas about how to model this lack of knowledge or this ambiguity and assign that type of modeling to people who are acting in financial markets. And now this is what you call multiple priors representation? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's multiple priors because each individual has multiple ideas about what the future might look like? Right. All, we, we think of it as they only, they, they don't know specifically the probabilities of these various things that could happen if the stock is going to go up, if it's going to go down, but they can put bounds on the possible probabilities. So they know uh, there's at least some chance that the stock will go up. There's at least some chance that it will go down. Th then, we, then we say if you, if you have beliefs or preferences like that, uh, you know, information that, that gives that amount of, of certainty about the future, um, then how do you change your portfolio decisions and how do you how do you decide which stocks to invest in and which asset classes are mm -hmm. best for you and so that's the individual investors problem right. acting optimally in some sense in right. this highly suboptimal environment right okay right. and but what you do in your work is to add them all together into right. a market right and and to make them all different from each other so right. you're really doing two things you can start with the individual who has who has per, perhaps um, a set of information that's less clear or less you know less specific. But then the question which which uh, Giant and I were very interested in was to what extent will investors that have information like this or that have preferences like this to what extent will their behavior make markets look like the rest of economics or other economic models. Uh, predict markets will be like? Do, do, does the presence of, of ambiguity or this lack of knowledge lead to implications in market prices and market outcomes that are different from what traditional economic models would, would predict? So this is what you mean by your title, informational inefficiency. So the, the, you're comparing this to the uh, efficient markets hypothesis sort of standard case in finance, is that right? Right, right. So one of the yeah. kind of core organizing principles in financial economics, at least from a theoretical perspective, is, is this idea of market efficiency, that, that when information is revealed to an individual or a small subset of the market, then they act on it in such a way that that information is reflected in prices. Mm -hmm. And so prices, in some sense, reveal the information that individual investors get to everyone. Because um, people are trading on that information. Right, exactly. As they, mm -hmm. as they um, 
you know, receive a hot stock tip, then they, their demand for that stock goes up, and that inequilibrium often leads to the price increasing. So what we wanted to do was see if there were situations in which uh, these individuals with ambiguous information or with preferences that, 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 um, that cared about this ambiguity would, would lead to situations where they get new information and that information is not revealed. Prices are inefficient in that others that are observing the market can't infer their information just by looking at the prices. Mm -hmm. And so you're preceding this. This is a. You're, are you simulating this? Are these? Are you creating theorems, or what is the method here? So there's a there's a little of both. So okay. uh, initially, uh, my my co-author and I have a paper that is that is pure theory. So so what we're doing is uh, constructing a mathematical you know a representation of an economy, and we have individuals who uh, have expected utility preferences more of the traditional form. We have individuals who who are averse to ambiguity, and then we we demonstrate that you can get prices which don't reveal all of investors' private information. Mm -hmm. um, this is a mathematical result. Yeah, that's a pure theory. You know, that's okay. a theorem. As we've moved on, we've now tried to look at some applications of this, and, and we do that in ways where we make the environment much a little more complex and, and add some nuances that are more perhaps realistic. And, and in doing that, we, we've also done some simulations and, and uh, in situations where, where solving the model analytically isn't as tractable. Mm -hmm. And by simulations, you mean you're, these are computer, these are on computers. You're, right, right. So we can you're generate programming your artificial world and seeing exactly. and, and running it through its paces. Yeah, we can we can uh, kind of be creators in this in this yeah. instance and and say let's pretend that the distribution of stock payoffs looks like this, and then actually uh, generate stock payoffs. And you have multiple agents in this world. We do. So does this connect up with this uh, agent-based approach to finance that is starting to percolate? Because yeah, there, you have this heterogeneity there. and There's been a broad movement in, in uh, theoretical finance and, and also more applied work um, to kind of incorporate the asset pricing phenomena that might come from uh, increasing the heterogeneity of investors. And so what we're doing is trying to extend this even further to allow uh, for investors whose preferences fall outside of the typical classes used in these asset pricing models. You're looking to me pretty young. So you're, you're an assistant professor at Brigham Young, yes, and um, so this this kind of area uh, is something that you wrote your thesis on. Yeah, but you were an undergraduate in economics sure. too. And what made you think that you wanted to go on in economics and get a PhD, and of all things, become a professor? Because people who know finance have lots of choices open to them. I guess there's a few things when you're thinking about career paths in terms of economics. I think economics provides a lot of great options uh, as an undergraduate degree. Um, I, I actually found that I was fascinated by the, the questions, and, but it has to be more than that. I was fascinated by the questions that economics asks. You know, uh, why are risk premia what they are, and, and uh, why do people choose the allocations of, of assets and the allocations of consumption goods that they choose? I found that very interesting to, to think about and think about modeling. But that's not enough. I also really enjoy the tools. So I enjoy mathematics. I enjoy uh, you know, the small amount of computer programming that I do, you know, st statistical analysis and things. Um, and I think that's really important, actually, because if a paper takes you a year to write, about the first month or two is, is this really fun process of thinking about economic ideas and, and how uh, the agents in the, in, the, in the model or in the economy are going to make decisions and what effects changes in the parameters will have on their decisions. And that's a wonderful time. And then you spend the rest, the rest of the 10 months checking the math and making sure that, that all of your derivatives go in the right direction. So you really have to like the tools as well um, so that those other 10 months you're, you enjoy being there. And, and you know, at this point, uh, academia is the right career for me because there's nothing I look forward to more than a summer day with nine hours in my office, mm -hmm. no interruptions. Mm -hmm. You know, because those problems really fascinate me. Uh, you know, I'm just very interested in the questions that... Well, that's very interesting. We've given grants to economic historians who express the same sense of you know, being in the archives, going through the boxes, that sent, which is they love the process. Mm -hmm. When you say loving the tools, it, it sounds to me yeah, really yeah. just that being alone with your problem or something like that <laughs> is, 
itself quite a pleasurable thing. Which probably says a lot about me as a person. Yeah. But, yeah. but you're not alone. This is a co-author co mm -hmm. work. Um, you're, and your co-author is where? My co-author is Jayan Gangulin. He's at Cambridge. And, uh, and so how did you meet and get to work together? So we were classmates uh, at Cornell okay. in graduate school. And, and we were working on um, somewhat related topics, not, not entirely related, but, but uh, we got to having discussions about this particular idea of, of could you see, were there testable implications of preferences that were outside of the expected utility class? And, and as we talked, uh, you know, these, these papers kind of came out of it, and so it's something we've been working on for a few years, these mm -hmm. you know, ideas related to this. So this grant is joint, and yes. uh, so I, I noticed that you're planning to, to meet. So you find, even though you like on a summer's day spending nine hours working alone, you also make plans to fly across the ocean. So this face-to-face -face time is also important. in it's the vital? Yeah. Is it vital? Yeah. Tell me. Um, we, so we, we yeah. spend, you know, in, in our collaboration, I, I think a lot of collaborators are different, but in ours, uh, we'll spend, you know, we speak on the phone a few times a week often and, and, and you know, talk about the, the problems we're encountering, how the paper's progressing and things like that. But, um, you know, the, it's very, uh, the, the, the time we spend together, usually, you know, a few days up to a week, is very productive. It's just very helpful to have someone in the same room with you who's thinking about exactly the same problem, but often looking at it from a slightly different perspective. I will state a hypothesis. I wonder if this thing is true. Can we, you know, is, can we prove this? And, and sometimes he'll immediately say, no, that, that can't be true, and here's a counterexample. Here's why it won't work. Um, and you know, often it'll happen the other way. He'll say, you know, I wonder if this is true, and I'll say, if it's true, here's the proof, you know, and, and, and uh, we'll kind of hash it out together. And that, that time together, you know, a week uh, being in the same room with the chalkboard uh, does a lot more work than maybe two or three months. Um, on the phone and, and working on your own and things like mm -hmm. that. So yeah, that's the, the collaborative process is, is pretty important for our, the work that we do. Well, I look forward to meeting your co-author, um, but uh, for now, let me just uh, welcome you to our stable of INET economists and wish you good luck in this search to model the unmodelable, moving in the direction and hopefully uh, giving us a better sense of, of, what, of what is at stake in these strong assumptions that we've made before and weakening them a bit and moving toward toward reality. Thanks very much. Thank you.